Welcome to Midnight Mass. It is an honor and a privilege to be here. I have uh, been associated with a couple of institutions, but never one uh, with the majors, and I consider you all honorary math majors. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> fortnightly on Saturday to give you other colloquium talks. I think it's a wonderful thing, and I think every honorary math major should have the opportunity to do this. Um, So I guess I regard this as a colloquium talk, and I think one of the one of the roles of, of, of colloquium talks is to um, fill in gaps in the undergraduate math curriculum. People often talk about interesting things that you might not see in a class, um, and I think that's what a lot of you guys have been giving talks on over the course of the year. So I'm going to do something sort of like that, except for I'm going to talk about um, what you would see in a first course in complex variables, which fits the description, because though we have a course on the books in complex variables, we haven't found the staffing to offer it in the last five years. Um, and so, so we may as well put it into this space. Um, another great tradition with colloquial math talks is to try to prove the fundamental theorem of an algebra, of algebra as a corollary. And, uh, the main result that you present to demonstrate its importance, and so if we have time remaining, I will do that. <laughs> so, I'd like you to consider a function as taking the complex numbers to the complex numbers. Uh, this blackboard font C is the complex numbers. <laughs> and, and, and I'm going to ask, what does it mean to be differential in a complex sense? What does it mean for a function taking the complex numbers of the complex numbers to be differential? Um, and the first thing, well, to be differential, a function really ought to be uh, well approximated by a linear map. So um, the natural first question to ask is, what are the linear maps from C to C? It's multiplication by a complex number. Thumbs up on C's R E V I theta. Um, so you multiply by Z is R E V I theta, and what this does, okay, if W is rho E to the I phi, then Z W is R rho E to the I theta plus. And so what do we do is we add the angles and we multiply the amplitude. That's what complex multiplication does. And so uh, any linear map multiplies the amplitudes and it adds the angles. So what this is, is this is rotation, rotation by theta, dilation by rho. And the question we're going to ask is what nonlinear maps, I want you to just think for a moment. We often like to model C as R2. If we think of this, we can think of this as a map from R2 to R2. We can think of F of X plus IY as being given by a real part and also a complex part. And we can think of, of uh, forming a vector field out of this, for example, the vector field BB if we wish. And we can think about properties of that vector field. And if that vector field is differentiable in the complex sense, right, or in the real sense, right, if the vector field UV is differentiable, that just means it's approximated by some linear map, it need not be complex multiplication. This just has to be, we just need that. U of x, y, v of x, y. It has to be given by u at some x naught, y naught, v at some x naught, y naught, plus some matrix A times the vector of displacements.
Right. And A is some matrix, A need, need not have a special form that uh, the matrix would have if it were complex multiplication. All right, so, so this is just the first thing is that for, uh, for a number of differentiable in complex sense, it is more special than just being differentiable in the real sense. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about in what way it's more special. And just, I, I hope I'm not, I hope I'm sort of pitching at a great level, but can I get a thumbs up if you've seen the kosher Dumont equations before? Right, I'm expecting mostly to have your thumbs down. Thumbs up, which is fantastic, but okay, we'll just go through that. Simplicity, and, and we, we sometimes do this. I mean, I could. There's lots of things I could do here, but um, this should really be true. And I have a complex plane here. This should really be true, regardless of what path I take towards the origin. Right? The pair delta x delta y is going towards the origin. Maybe it's spiraling in. Maybe it's going in along the x-axis. Maybe it's going in along the y-axis. The limit should be the same in any case, right? Um, and so I'm going to consider two cases. So let's look at um, okay, case one. I'm going to set delta y equal to zero. And I'm going to look at what happens when delta x goes to zero. So this is the limit along the x-axis. I'm thinking of pinching it towards zero along the x-axis, but I'm sticking on the real axis along this limit. And what I have is a limit as delta x goes to zero u of x plus delta x y minus u of x y plus i times v of x plus delta x y minus v of x y all over delta x. Now knowing a little bit about derivatives of real value functions of real variables, I can write this. I'm going to adopt some notation from um, partial differential equations where I use a subscript to denote the derivative with respect to. And so if I look at the real part of this, I can see that I'm taking u of x plus delta x minus u of x, 
And why I can really regard as just a parameter because it's not changing at all. I can divide that by delta x. And when I take the one as delta x goes to 0, I recover the derivative of u. Similarly, I have this other function p. And it's just a real value function of two real inputs. It happens to be the imaginary part of a complex function, but we know how to do calculus with real numbers. And so, again, as I take the one as delta x goes to 0, I can just regard y as a parameter when I, when I recover as the x derivative of v. And so the derivative of that has got to be ux plus i vx. However, it is also true It's also true that if I <coughs> f prime of uh, z has also got to be equal to what happens if I just squeeze in along the imaginary axis, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Now doing this, and I suppose it's always good to write things down, so I'll just write down everything. Now I have one that's delta y is going to zero. And I have u of x, y plus delta y minus u of x, y plus i times v of x, y plus delta y minus v of x, y. And now I divide by, what do I divide by here? What's the only thing? What's, what's uh, what delta y? i delta y. I, and I'm allowed to divide by i delta y. This is what makes Complex, uh, complex calculus is different from uh, calculus in the plane. You can't divide by a vector, but you can divide by a complex number. You have to divide by the magnitude of a vector, which is just a real number. But you're allowed to do division with complex numbers, and so I have a really different thing in the denominator here. And on top, what do I get? Up top, I get uh, this is going to be u y over i, and over here, this is v y, and the i's cancel out. <coughs> okay. But this guy is equal to this guy as a complex number. Since one over i is just minus i, I guess I can rewrite this as minus i u y plus v. But the fact that these two are equal as complex numbers implies that what we must have, since these guys are equal, I need, well, let's just, while we're on the habit of bad word, <laughs> <laughs> the imaginary part of the complex number has to be the same, and the real part of the complex number has to be the same. So I get ux is equal to by, and I get vx is equal to minus u. These equations are called the cauchy riemann equations. It's probably the least important part of them is their name, but, well, since Google's been around, it's maybe not true. Um, <laughs> and uh, and it, it's a very rigid restriction. This need not be true if I just have a real function and I demand that it be, um, and I demand that it be differentiable in a real sense. Yes. Is this condition enough to say it's differentiable? Because it seems like you can approach from any number of directions that aren't these two. And just because the limits are the same in these two directions doesn't mean it's the same in any direction. That is correct. And it's a very good question. Um, so I had specialized to two special cases here to prove a point. However, I have this case up here. I could separate this case out into uh, so the answer is yes. It is enough. The question is, can I convince you of it in a way that's not going to make that release fine and quickly? Um, well, for the moment, let's just say that it is uh, necessary but not sufficient. It happens to be sufficient as well. Okay. But <laughs> it turns out it's a pretty strong condition. Okay. Pretty strong condition. And we will, uh, we will be able to see that a lot will follow just from this. Even if more happens to be true. Which nothing more does happen to be true. <laughs> Since I can't convince you.
do that at the moment. So these are the cauchy riemann equations. And what can we conclude from these cauchy riemann equations? That's the next thing. And there's a PDE answer to this question, but I'm not going to go in that direction right now. I'm not going to go in that direction right now. What I would like to do is I'd like to consider the following vector field. Again, we have F taking C to C, and we have F with X plus I, Y, I'm thinking of as having a real part and an imaginary part. And I want to consider the following vector field. U minus B. Well, Let's consider that, and let's also consider what it means to integrate around some curve gamma in the plane, f of z, dz. So I want to do this, and, and I'm going to have in the back of my mind that this might be a useful vector field. What do I mean when I'm talking about an integral, a complex function? I guess we should write down something else. Since I erased the cauchy riemann equations, we should write that down again. Up to a sign. So what do I mean by the integral of a complex function over a contour? What do I mean by the integral of a real function? The line. The line integral, yeah. yeah. So, I've got my plane here. And I've got some curve gamma. And what I want to do is, I'm going to write this as u plus iv. And I'm going to then have to multiply this by the tangent vector to gamma, which I'll call t sub x plus i t sub y. So this is the integral I want to study. And it's going to have a real part and a complex part. Should we write down the real part and the complex part? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so the real part, I'm going to have u t x minus v t y. Okay. Plus, and then the imaginary part is going to be v t x plus u t y. So how, how on earth does that help us? <coughs> I'm going to close off this loop. I'm going to close off this loop again. I'm going to say it down as a region R. And I'm going to say what this is is this is the vector field u negative v dotted with the tangent dx dy. And then this is the vector field u v and it's u minus v and it's dotted with something else. What is it dotted with? ty minus tx. What is that if this is the tangent vector? It's a normal vector. Thumbs up if you take a course of vector calculus. So 
if I have a vector field, and I dot it with a tangent vector, and I integrate it around a closed contour that encloses an area, and I have a vector field, and I dot it with a normal vector, and I integrate it around a closed contour that encloses some area, what can I say about those integrals? Minus v x minus u y. There's no divergence, and there's no curl, and so my integrand is zero. So it tells me now the integral around any closed curve is zero. The integral of a complex function that is differential in a complex sense around any closed curve is equal to zero. That's interesting. Are there any questions at this point? This is not true. I just look at vector fields and I don't demand them to be differential in a complex set. It's very, very rigid condition. And the function be differential in a complex sense. And yet, a lot of the functions that we know and love have this condition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are a number yeah. of things I could do yeah. next. Yeah. Like, I to yeah. so, yeah. Does this mean like a constant real value of like from C to C is in C to R, but just gives you a constant number is not differentiable? Because it seems like you can integrate it over. Ah, that's true. But if you integrated the divergence of that function, you would not. So if it's okay. right, if you have a constant number. But like didn't we start out just integrating the function? We started out just integrating the function, but you know what you do? You have to you have to worry about the tangent vector. So if this is constant, it pulls out of the integral, and you're integrating the tangent vector. And if you integrate the tangent vector around a closed curve, that's going to be zero. Do you buy it? Yeah. Okay. Good question, by the way. Are there further questions? of this fact, so what have we shown? What do we know now? We now know that the integral around, I guess I'm going to put a little circle here to indicate that it's the integral around the closed curve. It's zero, and this is true as long as that is differential in complex sense. Now 
I'm going to make a truly outlandish claim. <laughs> the claim is the following. Again, I have a function, and it has this nice property, it's differential, I where I care for it to be. And I'm going to claim that it is enough to know the value of this function, it's enough to specify the value of this function on a closed curve. So let me write down explicitly what I mean is that f of z is equal to the following. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw myself a little circle of radius delta right around z. And now the function f over zeta minus z is no longer problematic as long as I restrict not to the region enclosed by c, but the region in between C and this little circle. I can deform my contour continuously. 
I can, why can I deform my contour continuously? Because last time when we did the contour integration around here, right, in order to show that it was zero, what we do, we use the divergence theorem and Stokes theorem is the name of the other one. And we said I could rewrite this as an integral over the bounded region. Right? And since the thing vanished on the bounded region, it had to vanish on C. But our thing is no longer defined everywhere, so we can't do that trick. But you know what we can do? If we consider this guy our bounded region, the integral over in the shaded region is zero. And so the integral on the boundary of on its boundary has to be zero, but it just has two pieces of this boundary. It has this inner circle C prime and this outer circle C. And so the integral over one has to be equal to the integral over the other. So I can replace my integral over C with my integral over C prime. Yeah? And the nice thing about C prime is I can parameterize that. When I'm in C prime, on C prime, we just have uh, zeta, which is the dummy variable that's moving around here as I integrate, is z plus delta e to the i theta. And zeta is our new variable of integration, and it's going from 0 to 2 pi. And so I can write d zeta then is. Uh, i delta e to the i theta d theta from the change of variables formula. Throwing this in here, these integrals become 1 over 2 pi i, and now I'm integrating from 0 to 2 pi. I have f of z zeta minus z is just uh, delta e to the i theta, but my d zeta, which I lost when I went down here, but it's really there. <laughs> my d zeta is an i delta e to the i theta d theta, which just makes you think that we must have done something right. And then we're also adding this guy, 1 over 2 pi i times this integral. Um, and again, now we have f of zeta minus f of z, and the d zeta over zeta minus z again cancels to so just get i. That's i d theta. Right? And this is also easy. This is integral from here to 2 pi. As we said, we get to all this beautiful cancellation. So uh, there's no theta at all in here. So when you integrate from 0 to 2 pi, you just get 2 pi, and 2 pi i's cancel. And so this first term is f of z. But the second term is 0. I have a, um, right? Because I have this super small circle here. And f's a nice function. It's continuous. So if I make that circle small enough, I can make f of z as close to f of z as I wish. And since it doesn't depend at all on the size of this circle, I may as well just take the limit of delta goes to zero. In which case, f of zeta is equal to f of z, and I just get zero. So this guy is zero. Yeah, I guess I'm wondering if that term you added on never interacted with the other one at any point, why did we need to add it in the first place? I know, because we started with an f of zeta up here. So the term I added was this piece and that piece. Okay. But that's it. That's that's the right I question. I did not answer. notice that those actually had different variables in there. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 the right question to ask. Because um, a lot of a lot of times published proofs are not parsimonious. Right? Um, certainly, the proofs that I present are rarely the best ones. Uh, it's always it's always good to see if there's a better way. All right. So. Extraordinary, extraordinary fact. What we're saying here, let's think about what we're saying. So wait, we did some computation and that proved the fact, but maybe it doesn't make a whole lot of sense yet. That's okay. Um, really extraordinary fact. We're saying not only 
not only is the value of a function on the interior of this domain, the, um, uh, this value is determined solely by, by the values on the boundary of the domain, but it's a particular kind of weighted average. Right? What does this integral say? This integral says I'm going to weight my boundary values by 1 over, not exactly my distance to the boundary, but by 1 over the, the difference between the complex number of the value of the function I'm seeking to evaluate and the value of the function at the boundary that I'm using in my weighted average. So that difference goes in the denominator. And that's going to be some complex number. And if this has big, if this complex number has a very, very small magnitude, one over that complex number is going to have a very, very big magnitude. So what this is saying is if I'm looking, right, if my z were all the way over here, then I care a whole lot more about what's happening here than what's happening there. Because one over z minus zeta is going to be pretty big when, when zeta is down here, but one over z minus zeta when zeta is here is going to be pretty small. The opposite, thank you. Z minus zeta is going to be pretty big down here, and hence 1 over z minus zeta will be pretty small. Whereas z minus zeta will be pretty small here, and hence 1 over z minus zeta will be big. So what this is telling you is that the value of a function, which is different from the complex sense, I'm tired of saying that, I'll just say analytic. Um, the, the value of a differentiable, of, of an analytic function on the interior of some domain is just a weighted average of the boundary values. A very, very special feature that these functions have. Okay, so that's another thing that's true. Are, are you guys still interested in paying attention? Do I have more to say? Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. Um, So like, I don't know, we five of a complex variables course. <laughs> I skipped some stuff. <laughs> there's, other, there's other actual material that happens along the way. Um, but a lot of it is reminding you about some fundamental theorems of vector calculus and vectors and plane and complex multiplication. Alright, so what do we know so far? We know that uh, F takes C to C is analytic. Then we have this formula, f of z is equal to uh, the integral over some closed contour containing z of f of zeta times z minus zeta d zeta. This is uh, called the Cauchy integral formula. Thank you. Did you drop the 1 over 2 pi i at some point? Uh, <laughs> only, only in the imaginary world where I write things. <laughs> Thank you, man. The complex world. The complex, yeah. yes. In the complex world, the eye is fighting. Just like the other, behind the other sheet of the yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is our, uh, this is our Cauchy integral formula. And I think this actually says quite a lot. Um, So first of all, I claim that this implies uh, that f is, I can take the derivative of f by differentiating this function, 1 over z minus zeta. And I can actually differentiate it again.
done it. So once my function is differentiable once, it's differentiable infinitely many times. Once my function is differentiable once, it is differentiable infinitely many times. So I can't have quarters. No, There's, there are three different classes, C infinity, real analytic, and complex analytic, and each lives inside of That's not true. Um, e to the minus 1 over x is an example of a function, all of whose derivatives vanish at the origin. Uh, excuse me, the, the, the function which is 0, sorry, sidebar. So g of x is equal to 0 for x less than or equal to 0, and e to the minus 1 over x for x greater than 0. Uh, g is, all of g's derivatives exist, and they all um, vanish at the origin. Nevertheless, if you were to try to use that information to uh, construct g uh, via a Taylor series, you would be only half right. So um, this is a this is a sometimes called C infinity flat function. Right? It's, it's not it's not real analytic. So having all of your derivatives uh, as a real function is not. But if you are once you're differential once you're differential. Plus uyy is equal to zero. 
Similarly, if I differentiate this guy in y, and I differentiate this guy in x, and I use the quality of mixed partials for the u, I'm going to get vyy plus vxx is equal to 0. So both of these guys satisfy a particular partial differential equation. Well, Laplace's equation. And it so happens that Laplace's equation is not allowed to have local minima or local maxima. Unless you're constant. Unless you're constant. And what would happen at a local maximum? Yeah, or at least there's some way. Certainly the canonical model for a local maximum. take two x derivatives and you take two y derivatives, uh, they're both going to be negative. Okay. Um, so it turns out, right? so here's a fact, and I'm, I, I, I actually should have a short proof of this, but it's escaping me at the moment. Um, so I just gave you that heuristic argument, uh, u and v have no local max. These are functions that whenever there's a critical point, it would use a sap or a center. Uh, sap. Yeah. So these guys have no local maximum. Now that that tells me that tells me that f can't have any maximum. That can't achieve its maximum value either. Because what is right, the magnitude of f squared is u squared plus v squared. And so f can't be bounded. If f were bounded, u and v would have to be bounded. And they can't be bounded on the whole, on the whole plane. Like they, they have no local max and also they can't be bounded. Uh, So if f is an analytic function, and it's bounded, if it has an upper bound on the complex plane, if it's an analytic function in the whole complex plane, and it has an upper bound somewhere, then the function is necessarily constant. The theorem goes by the name of the You might, you might say, actually, the theorem says that then P actually has D roots counting multiplicity. But once you have one root, you can factor that out and divide and get a polynomial degree D minus 1. Just do it D minus 1 more times, and the next thing you know, you got D roots counting multiplicity. So it's good enough to say that you have one root. So that's what the theorem says. If you got a polynomial in the complex planes, it's got a factor. 
And what's the proof? All right, so famous last word, suppose not. <laughs> suppose not. Then f of z is equal to 1 over p of z is analytic and bounded. Why is it analytic? This thing's got no root. Right? So this thing's got no pole. I can differentiate this. What do I, right? I, can, I know how to compute this. I know the chain rule. What is it? It's, uh, it's p prime over p squared. That function's nice and continuous. So this thing's got no root. Moreover, is this bounded? Yeah, it's bounded. Because what happens as z goes to infinity, I only care about the dth term, right? and that's going to infinity magnitude. So this thing's got to be going to zero in magnitude as z is going to infinity magnitude, so it's got to be bounded. So this guy's bounded, it's analytic, but this theorem, which I didn't exactly prove, but I, I stated, says that that can't happen. And so, so uh, fundamental algebra is algebra proved, it's a consequent of the maximum principle. Um, which we get to know a little bit about. Um, there's a lot to, I mean, there's a semester worth of stuff to say here, but I'll, I'll pause for questions. Yeah, yeah, so you've said a lot about what uh, analytic functions can't be because they have all these special, but like, what are some examples of analytic functions? Oh, that's a great question. So any, any polynomial is an example of an analytic function. Uh, any rational function is analytic away from its poles away from the roots of the denominator. Any power series is an analytic function. So like e to the z is analytic. Sine and cosine are analytic. And you might think they have local maxima, but it's only on the real line. Because right? the sine of a complex argument is a singe, and so, so it's not bounded in that direction. Right? Um, yeah, all those local maxima on the real line. Um, uh, so, or they're at least not the same one. And not consistent at all. But at any rate, they're certainly not. They're certainly not a little massive. Um, and any composition of analytic functions is analytic. Any product of analytic functions is analytic. And any ratio of analytic functions is analytic away from the zeros of the denominator. So you can build analytic functions in the same way. E to the sine x, e to the sine z, e to the sine z over z plus z squared minus <laughs> over z cubed. So almost anything you could think to write down. Right? Z bar is not analytic though. So the map z goes to its complex conjugate is not. not differentiable in a complex sense. Because, so then u is equal to x and v is equal to minus y, we can see that the cauchy riemann equations are not going to be satisfied. Um, and so this is the one, sort of everything that you would, any kind of function that you would write down and just plug z into it is going to work. The problem is if you need z bar to build your function. So the function that's the magnitude of a complex number, which is the square root of z z bar, not analytic. And there's a whole other issue. So the square root, I didn't talk at all about multi-value functions, but things like uh, log is really only defined up to 2 pi i? Because when you exponentiate something, when you exponentiate that thing plus 2 pi i, that's the same as multiplying your exponentiated thing by e to the 2 pi i, which is just 1. And so the logarithm takes all of these 
invalid as a whole. I mean, the theory of Riemann surface is, is sort of the idea as well. Maybe the domain isn't really a complex plane. Maybe the domain is many, many copies of a complex plane that have been cut and stitched together. Right. And so you sort of you can imagine almost like a parking garage. So if you wanted to think of like where is um, you know let's say is the, the fifth root defined. why if you integrate 1 over z on a closed circle, you can get something other than 0. You can get 2 pi i. So what you've done is when you go around I mean, 1 over z, if you integrate it, you should get log. I mean, so you're evaluating the log of some point on the circle minus the log of the same point on the circle. But it's actually, you've actually gone up a layer on the parking lot. Um, so, so anything you can write down that uses z is going to be analytic, except sometimes you have this funny thing where you have to snip and cut and paste and glue and do certain rates and make it make sense. <laughs> <laughs> there are lots of very natural functions you can write down that use a complex conjugate, like, like extracting the mag magnitude of a function, and that is not analytic. And so, I mean, yeah, so all the beautiful stuff doesn't work. And there's other beautiful stuff that works, but that's not the subject. Did I come close to addressing your question? Yeah. 